what's going on. They've come here before. They like this place. They always have. Hello, and welcome to uh, the National Michael Chekhov Association's NMCA Way. And we're here to chat, to meet, and discuss with Madam Gail Cronauer, one of our NMCA certified teachers, in fact, our first certified teacher in Texas. And she is a, a, an awesome actor as well as an awesome teacher and director. So uh, it's been my privilege to know her for over 10 years, and we um, welcome her. So say hello, Gail, please. Hello, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to jump right in. I'm going to uh, try to screen share, Bean, and this is the trailer of The Bast of Night. Uh, here we go. Number, please. Hello? What's going on, Everett? 718 here at WOTW. We got a sound we'd like to play that seems to be bouncing around the valley tonight. So Gail has a, a supporting role in The Vast of Night, and we are here, since Gail is a certified uh, NMCA Michael Chekhov teacher, uh, to ask her some questions about her role. So the first question that I'm going to ask uh, Gail is just what kind of response and what's happening in your life regarding this um, as this film is gaining some momentum? First of all, we shot the film in 2016, fall of 2016. Uh, and it was um, presented to us as an independent film by a really interesting filmmaker, uh, interesting script. So uh, you really need to go audition for this. So um, that process happened. Um, I rehearsed the film, we shot the film, and then it went away. <laughs> so uh, nothing was heard for um, by me for a while, a year, even two. There was a local person uh, who is one of the producers, Adam Dietrich, whom I would see at various events. Oh yeah, uh, Andrew Patterson is really working away. It's looking great. This went on for a year and a half. And then finally it was, oh, the film is going to slam dance. This was um, over a year ago. Um, I was not able to go. Oh, the film is going to Edinburgh. Oh, the film is going to Toronto. Oh, the film is going to New Orleans. So I saw it um, a year ago still in a kind of rough cut at the Overlook Film Festival in New Orleans. 
and um, then what's happening next? And then finally, oh, we have a, uh, a premiere date. Oh, no. Oh, Amazon bought it. Oh, it's going to be showing in drive-ins. Oh, it's on Amazon. So it's been such a long process. And I'm so in awe of the people who have continued to move this project forward, the director, the producers. Um, so now that it's finally happening, um, it's like a distant memory in many ways. Um, but I've found that it's been an opportunity for people that I haven't had contact with in a long time to reach out and say, I saw the film. And because it's been released at this very strange time, um, it's become, um, I think, a source of entertainment, a source of escape, a source of hope for so many people and the platform having it released on Amazon has made it something that people from around the world have been able to view and respond to, which is absolutely unbelievable to me as someone who has worked um, as both a screen and a stage actor. So often the audience is the audience of the people in Dallas, Fort Worth, or the people who have sought out this little independent film that I've done. And suddenly there are people who are seeing it from all over. And that's been um, incredible. And I, I find myself um, at moments um, so joyful and at other moments in a complete state of um, this can't be, isn't really happening. So. I suppose the atmosphere, the vibe, the message of the movie continues to resonate with me as I am both uh, in awe of this, but also um, having a hard time believing it. So <laughs> that's what's going on. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. So I wanted to begin, uh, yeah, I wanted to begin with, uh, with the end, like which is the present, because we don't quite know what's unfolding for the future. Uh, and and then uh, just backtrack a little bit. So um, have you participated in any panel discussions with the director, the cast, the producers, anything like that? Have you experienced well, that? This is so interesting to me um, because most of those kinds of events are ones that I've experienced uh, by watching oh, I've watched or listened to an interview with Andrew or uh, Andrew Patterson, the director, or I've watched or listened to uh, an interview that um, um, Jay Korowitz, who plays the young lead, male lead, uh, have done. Um, one of the themes that people keep talking about in a lot of the printed or online reviews that I've read is you have two people with these long monologues. Uh, one is a person of color and one is an older woman. And these are two demographics that don't get listened to very often. And I feel that I myself have, uh, from the very first moment that I heard it was going to slam dance, I wondered, oh, well, I, I wonder if my role is still gonna be in the movie. I wonder if I showed up at slam dance in the winter, um, if people would know that I was in the film or if I'm an older person, they're interested in the two young attractive leads. And I have felt um, myself um, backing away from uh, acknowledging or saying, hey, you know, I have a really neat role in this film um, because I didn't know how I would be received. So I find that really interesting. Um, so um, I haven't, I was, I, I um, was approached by, and this was all done over um, messaging on Facebook, um, a woman who was writing for, um, uh, some online blog asking me about the cryptic 
uh, chant incantation that I speak uh, and wanting to know what it was I was saying because um, the director had said, well, the actress came up with those words in the alien language that she chants and it would be interesting to have it played backwards. And I went, oh, Andrew, who was a very interesting young man who was not on social media and um, resisted um, uh, speaking about the film. Uh, in fact, when I did see it a year ago, I took a picture of myself with him at the premiere and posted it on social media. Oh my God, look at me with that. And I got an email that night. Andrew was not on social media, please take it down. And I went, oh my God, I've messed up. And I took it down and that sent me again into my old woman who should be discounted um, uh, archetype. <laughs> um, and so when I got this inquiry from um, this blogger about those words, I said, thought I need to contact Andrew. And so I said, Andrew, uh, I got this inquiry and I'm thinking about saying this. So I typed to him what I thought might be appropriate given who he is and the, um, uh, the mood in which he responded to her about playing it backwards, you know, like the Beatles records or whatever. Um, and I ran it by him. And I said, um, this is what I would say, that the words came to me in a moment of inspiration. And just like the character, I don't know what those words mean. They came to me. And um, I would be careful about repeating them because she wanted to be able to transcribe them and put them out there for the sci-fi fans. I said, I would be careful about repeating them because you saw what happened in the film. <laughs> and that's what I said. I said, so Andrew, what do you think? And he said, that's perfect. So that's what I sent back to the blogger. So that's been the one direct uh, interaction, although it was over the internet that I've had about the film. <laughs> oh, thank you, Gail. I I hope that our chat here is just the first of many and that the film continues its momentum and that uh, you, you uh, get the true um, attention that uh, the role is worthy of. I mean, one of your reviewers said that, that they felt that this, your performance was the best supporting actor performance that they have seen this year and that they hoped that the Hollywood community would see it because they felt that your performance was worthy of an Oscar nomination. So um, congratulations on that, whether some, such a thing manifests, because I know that in order, in most cases, for a nomination to come, it's a massive investment, economic investment in a massive amount of PR. And, uh, it, but you know, there is social media and momentum can certainly build around something. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we know that the shortest supporting actor performance that uh, has received an Oscar to date was that of Beatrice Strait in Network. Yeah. And uh, she has a total of six minutes. You have uh, not only uh, some voice time before we see you, but it's uh, what about 10, 11 minutes. It's almost a pure monologue with just a few inserted um, responses from Everett played by Jake Horowitz, as you said, and um, a little exchange with Sierra uh, McCormick who pay plays Faye. Um, so can we, I'm stepping us backwards because I want you to eventually get us back to your audition and prep, but I'm going to start with um, the post-production first question. Were you brought in to do the audio? Did you do any additional automated dialogue replacement or did you record the voice part on the set? What was the order? What was your onset uh, experience after uh, your post-production work? Well, let me, let me go back uh, in terms of pre-production. I mean, the audition, the casting, 
and then um, a day or two working on the script, which was very interesting. So to be in a room with Sierra and Jake and uh, the director and um, at least one of the screenwriters, uh, reading it, adding to it, changing it, deleting it. It was fantastic to be involved in that process. Uh, and then the shoot, it was um, one day, one night, because they were in night shoots at the time. So it was starting at sundown. We were working in a very uh, a small town in Texas and um, in a small house, a very small house <laughs> with no air conditioning at the tail end of summer. And we shot everything uh, that one night and um, any of the words that became voiceover were shot on the set. And I never went back for any ADR work. That was it. They were on a very tight schedule, a very tight budget, and there was no room for that. So that was that one day. Yes, I understand it was under a million dollars on the budget. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I understand that um, when very often these days in production because of the quality of the ability to capture sound and audio, uh, especially on a low budget, you do everything you can to capture the sound at the location at the That's time, uh, you mm -hmm. know, getting it in the can and then you uh, adapt it. So it's very common to videotape uh, the actual audios. Mm -hmm. uh, right. so let, let's talk about the onset process uh, itself and um, uh, and and just as a as a start point do you remember how many pages your your text actually covered was I mean often they say it's about a minute a page right it, it seems to me that the scene was about 12 pages long uh, this was in the original audition and um, I was given I never saw the whole script. I think they were being very careful about not giving away what was gonna be happening. I never had to sign uh, uh, an NDA. Um, Just to pause a, a non-disclosure right. agreement, NDA non-disclosure agreement, which means you're not allowed to tell anybody anything about the project you're working on. Go ahead, right. Gail. Yeah. Um, but the expectation coming in and this has become the expectation for um, auditions, um, was to be off book. I mean, that's oftentimes what is stated, um, or sometimes they'll veil that and say uh, performance level audition, right? Um, but it was important for me to be off book uh, because you'll see that I wear reading glasses and um, I wanted very much to not be masking my eyes when I did this. And I felt that it would serve me best to have that story in my bones. So I had the script um, for a couple of days, three or four days before the audition and spent a lot of time working with that. Um, coming on set what did you ask me specifically about starting the shoot yeah well you're there you're there so um we'd spent a, uh, everything becomes a part of the process um and um i was able to go to location which was um about 60 miles 50 60 miles from here so I went down and worked with Sarah and Jake and Andrew for a couple of days. And just that time to be with them in a room, um, feeling uh, a part of that creative process was fantastic. We don't often have that opportunity as an actor. The whole idea of rehearsal with a cast is like, <laughs> we just don't get to do that very often. 
all the rehearsal that you do, the creative work is generally what you do on your own. And so even though we weren't talking a lot about specifics, we were in the world of, um, the imagined world of the, um, the story, the film, and that was fantastic. Sierra had a dental issue at this time. And so there was all this crisis, crisis management going on. Oh my God, we have to deal with her dental issue. Um, and that in some ways added to the drama of the shoot. Uh, when I actually went down to shoot it a couple of days later, um, we were starting at sundown. So my call wasn't until like six o'clock at night and the town was closing down. It's a very small town. So there was a sense of everything else going away. And this is just going to be about um, being in this municipal building, which was the production office and entering into this and um, having wardrobe and the wig I had was not the wig that Andrew had envisioned, but this was the one that I was going to have. And that slow process of, I remember being in this huge space. It was like an airplane hanger. It was the size of an airplane hanger. And being in this space and getting into wardrobe and getting into makeup and into the wig and then Sarah and Jake showing up and it was the three of us there waiting for the set to be prepared so it created this little bubble around us and then to go to the set which was a tiny little wood framed house with very limited air conditioning in 90 to 100 degree heat, even though it was evening. And everyone uh, sandwiched into this very small space because you have so many people, the people who are doing sound, the people who are doing lighting, the people who are holding the script for you, the people who are shooting it. And it being suffocating in some ways. So what was the reality of the set became, was the reality, a mirror image of the reality of this woman's life to be in this incredibly confined, suffocating space. Um, there's a, there was an awful lot of work done by Adam Dietrich, who was uh, in charge of the creation of the look the locations, the set decoration. And there were all these articles that they had created about Mabel's life, um, the abduction of her son, the accusations that came uh, against her that were all over the place, which you don't get to see in the film. But it was so wonderful to suddenly have um, representations of what her history had been. Um, I sat in a chair, I never move. Uh, the character um, says, I don't, I don't get around much anymore. My groceries are delivered. There's a key under the planter on the porch, let yourself in. And uh, the room that I was sitting in, there was a TV screen on and there were all these books and the articles and um, uh, Andrew had asked that I create these words. So I had a little piece of paper and I created this chant and that paper was my connection to the past and my son. So that little prop became so important. And within this extreme confinement, um, we just started shooting. If, if I remember correctly, Sierra, did not show up on set at all that evening that it was only jake because sierra was having her dental issue so it was about i met her spent some time with her so i knew her but i don't even think she was there when we shot this and the process of shooting was so slow um i believe andrew wanted to get it in one take uh, it was a long time, but there are several of those really long takes in the film. And uh, I remember at one point, Andrew taking the camera 
off of whatever tripod or apparatus it was on and getting down on the floor and shooting up at me. And um, I mean, I had no idea what the scene, how the scene would uh, eventually be um, uh, contained in the film. So the process was long, lots of repeats. Let's do the whole thing. Let's go from the start. Let's just do this part of it. Um, and um, we just finished it in that one evening. <laughs> Fantastic. So let me go back to the beginning of what you just described and ask um, from a, what I observe from how you described that, uh, some checkoff approaches, mm -hmm. some NMCA suggestions, and one is to make friends with this space. Mm -hmm. Oh, that I think that's I think that's lovely. Um, so um, the whole I was um, listening to the audition workshop that you were doing this morning uh, with Jorg Andreas, and um, you talk about uh, the first step being to fall in love with the story, and um, that was certainly something that happened. Uh, there was a review in Forbes um, online this morning that talks about how there are these two actors who have monologues that actors dream of. And um, as an older woman, when I was first presented the script, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing <laughs> uh, to have this many lines. I mean, usually as an actor, your time on screen is so much about your reactions and is often MOS, without sound, there's, you know, it's you reacting. But to have that many words was absolutely overwhelming and exciting and terrifying. So to follow with that, to go, whoa, this is amazing. And to find the joy in that was um, really important to me and uh, came almost automatically because it was so such a gift. But then to show up on set and um, uh, to uh, have that sense of, oh my God, this evening is going to be about me. And all these people are here focused on me. Uh, there's an amazing sense of responsibility that could become this. And I was really working to allow myself to... Um, expand about that and the to take in all of the attention that had been paid by everyone who'd been involved in pre-production and whether that was the dress I was wearing or the hair that I had or the articles or the books or the tv or the chair there was so much to go whoa and just open myself up to and even though there were so many people in this tiny little space to, uh, and this is the thing that's always so exciting to me about working on set, you have all these people focused on you, sending their energy out to uh, help you to succeed and um, do the best possible work you can. When I saw the film in um, New Orleans a year ago, uh, Andrew talked about what it was to turn his movie over to someone for 10 minutes. And I'd never thought of it that way. And it's a good thing I didn't when I was shooting the film. <laughs> oh my God, he's giving it to me right now. But um, that sense of having that responsibility, which becomes an opportunity, um, was... Uh, I mean, just just amazing. And added to the otherworldliness, I think, of the uh, the whole story. Some actors like James Spader, uh, now on Blacklist, uh, work with Chekhov techniques by practicing and preparing all their work with the Chekhov tools before they come to the set, before they get into rehearsal. And once he gets into rehearsal, um, and that I'm saying this based on a conversation, telephone conversation he had with Mala Powers, who was my teaching partner for 18 years and the executor of the Chekhov estate. He told her that 
uh, he does all his prep through the Chekhov tools and then he comes to the set and he does that communion with the director, with the set, with the partners on the set, with the script, um, the writers, what's being given. And he trusts the preparation that he has had on his own from the, the Chekhov world. So my question to you is, did you in this or do you in other films, the many other films and TV projects that you've done, um, while on the set, do you actually consciously engage in Chekhov tools? And, uh, you know, and later I'll ask you, you know, the same question about how you prepare. So when you're on the set now. Um, one of the things that, uh, the primary thing that attracted me to the Chekhov work when I first did uh, the <laughs> workshop with you 10 plus years ago was the whole notion of tools, of having tools. That word had never been used, presented to me in that way. Um, and as someone whose father was a carpenter, I have tremendous respect for tools. Um, and mm, I've heard it said, I've said it myself, that you know, technique tools are what we use when inspiration is not forthcoming. It's like, oh, sometimes it's like, and I, I believe you've said this to me also, sometimes it's like, oh, I have it, it's right there. And other times it's like, I got nothing about this. I'm gonna have to really. And I, I can remember having that reaction to other things that I have auditioned for, sometimes been cast in, and gone, whoa, I had no idea. And I discovered by working what's going on here, who this person is. So for this, um, I think on set, and it's interesting because as I was watching the performance again, I think I've seen it three, three, three or four times now, um, I was so aware of um, the, uh, the connection with the other um, actors having Jake there as an amazing listener and that sense of wanting to reach out and grab him and say, you know, take me there to uh, meet up with these aliens tonight because I need to see my son. There was such a desire to do that, but the inability because I didn't want to scare him away, because I didn't have the physical strength, whatever. And so there would be times when I would be giving, given a direction by Andrew, um, would you do it again, but this time? And uh, I cannot be specific right now, I don't think, um, but it was like, okay, so what he's wanting me to do is to really take my circle of concentration and be more focused on, at this moment, on Jake. Okay, now it's on this piece of paper I have. Okay, now it's on that memory of something, or it's this thing that's happening in the room right now. So I could take what he was saying, and I had a way of making it specific to me. Um, to reach, I mean, there are archetypal gestures, to reach for the other person, to pull him into it, uh, to have a moment of expansion, to have a moment of contraction. So those are ones, especially because we were doing it over and over and over again. All right, this time I need to really don't contract at this moment, allow it to be a moment of expansion. So notes that I was given or let's try it again, but mm, I'd like to, mm, so I could make them very specific by using the tools to guide me. Um, so that's, um, that was extremely useful. And of course the atmosphere, it was it's like so much about atmosphere, the atmosphere right here, right now, but also the remembered atmospheres. And the whole film is a, a fantastic study in that, I think. I agree with you, and I, I feel you took us on such a journey, uh, and and what is so phenomenally intriguing, I think, and riveting. Um, and I think one of the one of the reviews or articles talked about. Uh, I think it was the Forbes article that talked about an overall atmosphere of awe and uh, and genuine uh, awe and genuineness. Mm -hmm. And somebody else talked about um, how your that how 
your performance doesn't go to the audience, it draws the audience to it. Right. And uh, it's like, uh, it really, I, I can really feel that sort of, that pull that you were talking about. And someone described it, uh, described an, uh, an atmosphere or your performance, I can't remember which, as having hushed urgency. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. And so I was wondering if that aspect was something that uh, that that you you brought forward, and and maybe that has to do. Maybe the other question is how much like your audition that you did was. How, what was the difference? You know, what was the the distance between the audition you delivered and the way the your multiple takes wound up being edited and presented right um well when i first saw the the film at the overlook film festival in new orleans a year ago uh i went oh my god the whole scene is in profile and you know as an actor i mean it's not totally true i mean because you can you know see both of my eyes but i I had expected uh, it to be more about um, the uh, what was going on here because when you audition for something, when I audition for something, you know, if it's uh, a self tape, you're pulling your eyes toward the camera without spiking the lens, without looking right at the lens as much as you can, so they can see your face. And when I auditioned for it, um, I had an off-camera reader. It was a live audition, and it is to make that other person the anchor to the piece. But then there are moments when the images, the memories, the concerns take you someplace else, take me someplace else, and then to come back. And those moments of going away to another place and coming back can be very powerful and really make those moments of contact um, uh, even more important. And when we were shooting it, of course, there was my sense of that carrying over from the audition. Um, but then when I saw the final take, it was like, whoa, what he really wanted was for the audience to have to lean in to, uh, to engage it. At one point in the film, if you've not seen it yet, and it's not in my scene, it's when Bruce Davis, who is the uh, radio caller, whom we never see, it's all voice, uh, voice acting. Um, there are moments when the screen goes totally black and Andrew is forcing you to, as much as he can, listen, 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 and not stop at your visual response to someone. And so in retrospect, and I, he might've said some of this on the set, I really can't tell you right now, um, there was that sense of listen, 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 uh, and of um, a desire to draw uh, Jake and Sierra into it uh, in order to make the story live for them. So um, um, I, I suppose that's now, when I reflect on it now, I can experience that. Uh, I can tell you that when you're doing, <laughs> when you're doing it, when I was doing the audition, and you're in a, a waiting room full of people who are auditioning for the same role, and you walk into a room, and there is a table full of casting people, some of whom you know, and some of whom you, you're meeting for the first time, uh, there's, uh, there can be a lot of, whoa, pressure and to leave the vibe of the waiting room and to come in to this moment with the reader. I mean, you even have to let go of the folks who are not the readers and to really focus on the person to whom you're reading and knowing that that is the person that you have to draw in, that you have to engage, that you have to uh, penetrate 
um, with your thoughts become so overriding. And when that is in your body, and for me, this is where the Chekhov tools are so important. It's not something that lives here. It's something that lives here. So even if there's a moment when the lines are gone, there's that physical connection, that concentration on the other that keeps things moving forward and um, allows you to, allowed me to get back onto the text if it went away. So um, there was preparation for that in the initial audition, but it was so much so, more so on set because of, um, um, I think this focus now coming from everyone and everything else in the space. Very, very dark. The room is so dark. There's so little light. You know, the illumination is the TV set and the one little light lamp that I'm reading by. You know, so that became really heightened and made more specific, I think, on set. You know, one of the things that is so uh, powerful is uh, uh, when I watch this, your scene, um, uh, as you said, you've got the chair there and it's in profile, and uh, but you have so many beats, so many, it shifts to so many uh, locations, issues, images, uh, images of being misjudged and attacked and uh, images of losing the pain of losing mm -hmm. your son and and uh, the shock of uh, you know even becoming pregnant and the shock of the loss of the baby daddy and all these things these nuances that you go through and I can and, and you have this hushed stillness going on this sense of urgency and in the story but we we travel with you and I feel the impulse is coming up from your pelvis Mm -hmm. These little teeny nuances that that radiate up, you know, from your pelvis. So um, this is one of the things I feel is so uh, full bodied, as still and you know as you are, we we feel that. And then at toward the end of your scene, when when he does, when Andrew does cut straight onto your face, um, and it's definitely a a uh, audience manipulating edit <laughs> he, enjoys, he does this repeatedly andrew does this repeatedly through the film he uses the camera as this mm -hmm. hovering presence mm -hmm. that is uh you know almost like an alien itself mm -hmm. watching yeah. what's going on and overseeing um and uh and that we feel um we feel or i experienced anyway a as the you're your reach, your deep sense of urgency, and this um, uh, this this obstacle that you know, if if she totally loses it here, she will totally freak them out. And yeah. so, I could really feel sort of the the sense of the gesture, the the conflict there within you, um, and and your uh, your uber goal to to be with your son to go to go there. Um, Let's go ahead, if there's anything else to say about uh, shooting, but let's, let's go ahead back to your um, preparation, your audition, and uh, what you did to prepare for the audition, how the, you shared with us how the audition was, anything more about that, and what you did between booking the job and showing up at rehearsal. <laughs> um, so um, the story, um, was so compelling and uh, not simply because it was a story of uh, aliens, but because of the human, uh, we, so, we so often don't have a sense in that kind of a situation, uh, any kind of suspenseful story. There aren't so many details given to you. And um, it was such um, a gift to have so many details about her um, past. Um, and so spending a lot of time uh, with the script, um, filling in, uh, imagining uh, the story of uh, living in a small town, 
her parents being absent, being shuffled from sibling to sibling, living with the minister's um, um, family, the whole disappearance of the people on that train. I mean, there were just so many little nuggets that were so uh, delicious. And um, I love working with this script and um, allowing those images to live in, live in me as um, the, the movie, <laughs> what was the movie of um, uh, her life or of that story? And to, um, and I, I'll tell my students, make the movie of the monologue. If you were standing back and watching it, what would that be? And at this point in her life, the character is standing back and watching the movie of her life um, with a sense of all those decades having passed and all of the experiences. I mean, she's not uh, somebody who's living under a bridge. She's someone who has a home and she's continued even after her son was abducted, disappeared to live a life and she had a nice dress on that she's probably made and she probably does her own hair because nobody else wants to do it. So there were so many wonderful details to imagine, to see, to feel. Um, so uh, that was a huge part of it, just living with those images. Um, and um, it was plugging into I know I'm someone who grew up on Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, so to have the history of, and, and not that that was ever mentioned when I was um, auditioning for it, but to have that um, uh, cultural connection to Roswell and aliens and wanting to believe in that um, was so much a part of um, falling in love with the story and um, making it very, very specific. Um, one of the other things that I was really um, um, concerned with or aware of was when there are moments of, um, uh, of joy in her, you know, at the very beginning, she says, who are your people? She talks to Sierra and, you know, who is she? And, oh, the radio show and, oh, you're going to go far. So she has still moments of uh, joy and openness and expansiveness in her being. But then there are moments that are dark um, when she talks about the, um, uh, the death of this man that she loved and uh, the way no one in the town believed her. So it was important for me to uh, find those moments of, of expansion and then the opposite, the moments were that of contraction. So I could really um, feel that. So I think that um, getting those into my being, into my body, into my mind, her own closed-mindedness about some things, and then her own moments of being, when she talks at the end about this is what I feel is going on, the aliens are doing, that the moment of um, scientific imagination were so powerful for me, for me too. So um, what of her was the thinking, the, the detective, the investigator, the searcher? What of her was the, the vulnerable victim? And what of her was the we will get to the bottom of this. So to find all those different parts of her. So she wasn't just a victim, wasn't just a sorry old lady. Um, and uh, the fact that she phones in, that she calls this radio station to me was such a, a, an act of courage, uh, an act of hope. So, so much of it was about, and, and because I knew it wouldn't be moving, you know, um, when I'm working on a script, and it's always a combination of getting the lines into me, but also getting um, the images of the lines into me. I'm up and moving, I'm up and walking, or I'm doing whatever physical activity 
um, seems appropriate or sometimes just what's going on in my life. This is my life right now. And if I were doing this story, I'd be sweeping the floor or walking the dogs. So to get the words into not only this part of my being, but this part of my being as well. So that's what I remember most. <laughs> Beautiful. Any specifics of how you worked on the audition itself? Uh, I knew at least two people. I knew there was a young man, a young woman there. So to create those relationships. Um, you, you talked this morning about moment before. I mean, what is that moment before? In the script, she does call into the radio station. But what has happened prior to that? I didn't know. Uh, because I didn't get to read the whole script, but something was happening. There is a shift. Uh, this moment is a moment where, uh, bear back. So there was a moment of feeling something. She's, I knew that she would be reading or chanting something. There's this piece of paper before the scene actually started. So what that was to be doing everything that she could to um, make contact with um, the aliens and her son. So there was exploration of that. Um, the actual audition for me is about going in and giving myself a moment to, there's always that moment of coming in and mm -hmm. seeing the people and hello, this is Andrew, the director, and this is Tony Cobrock, you know her because you've auditioned for her before and you know, whatever. And then there's a moment of letting go of that and imagining this atmosphere, this space, place, this vibe, the person to whom you're speaking and allowing that to happen and to give over to that. You talked about James Spader giving over to it on set. You have, I believe you have to give over to it in the audition and all that work and imagining you've done, you have to trust that. And um, you use the word truth before that's ah that's one of those things that always hmm you know puzzles me what oh what is that i mean i have two sons and i've certainly had moments when i felt an outsider and there have been moments when i've been isolated so there are some things that the character seems to be experiencing that i can relate to but i've never had her experience so to trust in the ability to uh, imagine that and to uh, know it is true at this moment. But then what does truth mean? And I, I remember one of, one of the most striking lessons um, that I ever, you ever shared with me was the whole lesson of ease and what ease is and that when people so often look at someone's performance they go no oh, i didn't believe that would you do it again whether it's on stage or film and when i've had occasion to do that to say that to a student or someone i'm directing for me it's so often about you're working too hard you know you're standing back and watching yourself rather than allowing yourself to invest to give over to the scene and it's so often about ease and that I think that's true in the audition that when I remember ease all the extraneous stuff gets cut away and the bones of what's going on is what's left and that becomes the truth of it the bones of it um, so ease, especially for me as someone who's come from stage to film, to make that adjustment, what is that about? Mm, that so often it is about 
ease because when there is ease there the truth is there the core the bones is there and it's not all of this stuff i think there's a time to give yourself permission to explore that but then when you're coming into this medium especially when you know that on camera for the audition it's going to be here and this is the scene where the character doesn't move so what's going on here is going to be so important and if i'm doing all of this then you're going to be seeing all of that and not this so to know what the frame is how intimate that's going to be and that that's going to be about pulling the other person to me with ease so i think that was huge and and for and for me that ease becomes trust and truth but it's about my trust in myself and my truth in myself michael chekhov talks about every role that we play being a gift, holding mm -hmm. and bearing a gift for us as a human being. Right. Do you have any thoughts about the gift that you got from working on this character? There's the gift of simply being able to do it. I've had, well, I did a, an audition workshop years ago with um, someone who'd written a book on auditioning and um, she talked about uh, why she had gone from acting to writing about acting and coaching that she realized that as an actor what she really wanted was to be chosen please pick me pick me and um there is something about that oh you chose me you like me you really like me or you love me you really love me so there was of course that the gift of being chosen um but chosen can mean so many things that you're chosen, they like you, they pick you to be on their softball team. But it can also be that you are the chosen in a much larger um, cultural or even spiritual sense to be chosen to tell this story. And I know that at some point, and it's easy to lose this once you get into, oh, we liked it and you have a great review or whatever, to lose, to lose touch with that that you were chosen all these people have chosen to be here working on this film yeah they're getting paid but they've chosen this project they've devoted years of their lives to this project and to be the one who is there at the front presenting it is an amazing honor and it's really easy to lose sight of that that's why when people start talking about things oh this is you know um worthy of nomination for this that or the other thing it's like whoa that's that's something that uh i can't i mean i can't even think about it i mean i i mean i do i'm human of course i do but the, <sighs> there was this opportunity to um embody this and share this and for it now to become something that people are watching and are responding to as beautiful or awesome or mysterious or however they're responding i mean that's an amazing thing and i'm probably much more aware of that now than i was when i was doing it so that's the gift that's the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> that even now i go whoa that's that's quite amazing um i had an experience years ago when i was at the beginning of my uh film career um where i auditioned for and this was way back in the days of you had to go there and they had to record you on vhs tape and always oh, and um the director was shooting this film with a very high profile uh hollywood actor and i went in and i read for the role and he oh, he was like oh my god you have to come back and be taped this afternoon. So I had to go back to be taped to a studio because they didn't have recording equipment at the original audition. And I was like, oh my God, this is it. This is going to be my breakout role. And oh my, I mean, I had my Oscar acceptance speech written. I, it was just like, whoa. And they went another way with the role. 
and they went with an actor who was very, very different from me. And I went, whoa, they went that way because this was, this was the, the pretty choice, the beautiful choice, the not who I am choice. And I went, whoa, there's, all you can do, Gail, is do the work and find satisfaction and joy in it because that may be what it is, just doing the work. And so my, people talk about, oh, I dreamed about this, I dreamed about that. I, it's like, at that point I went, it's really just about doing the work. And that's a lot, that's enough. And if there's something else that's lovely, but, huh, just <laughs> kind of stopped being something that I thought about. <laughs> No, and I've been at this point in my life. This coincides with some big life changes. I've been teaching. I was teaching full time when I shot this film. Um, so it was like, oh, can I just have to take off these couple of days to go work on this film? And I've never, I was never able to say to uh, um, certain people with whom I was working, oh, I need a couple of days off to go work on this movie. Um, that was not something that um, uh, was uh, thought to be responsible in terms of my uh, professional commitment there. So I would just do it on my own time. Um, so it was something that I made room for in my life that when I would then go back to the classroom or to a private session with a student, I I felt um, justified or galvanized or enriched by what I had done as an artist. So that movement back and forth has always been important to me. Anyway, so at this point in my life, I'm getting ready to leave that full-time teaching position after 24 years at one institution and many years at other places before that. And so this comes at a time, not the shooting of it, but the release of it, when I'm looking to um, move into a new chapter of my life. And so this is in some ways, um, the first page of that chapter <laughs> could be the last page of another chapter, the previous chapter, I don't know. So I'm just finding it really interesting. And I have no idea if there will be something else. I have a, uh, a casting director friend of mine who was actually a student years and years and years ago. I was his first acting teacher and he's been an LA casting director uh, working with big names for a long time, reach out to me and say, whoa, I saw your work and it was really wonderful. And you know, you need to update your IMDB and you need to do this because there are gonna be inquiries you know, after this. And I, I mean, to me, that's, that's sci-fi. <laughs> that's science fiction. <laughs> so um, I, it, it's made me think a lot about how people deal with this. It's made me think a lot about the people who, uh, we, who are celebrities and um, are um, criticized for being overly personal or protective of their, uh, their wife or their children. And I went, uh -uh. but I, I, I now want have some sense of what it must be to be in that situation of, yeah, I've had great acclaim for this piece of work, but what does that have to do with who I am as a person or an artist? And how do I reconcile that? Now, we talk about opposites all the time in the checkoff work. How do I reconcile the fact that I have to walk my dogs in a couple of hours, or I have to clean the toilets or sweep the kitchen floor? So I'm finding all that really interesting. How do you, what in, in, in view of what's going on in the, the world around us right now? I mean, my work this last week has been about, I gotta get this article out there on Facebook. I want people to know about this. So that's been my casting this last week. So I'm, I'm finding that really interesting. How does it all become part of who you are? Thank you. 
Uh, any questions uh, that we have for Gail? If you want to just unmute yourself and uh, ask Gail a question or share a thought or response or an observation if you've seen the film. And if you haven't, check it out. It's on Prime Video. <laughs> Sometimes there's different things explored during a new production. So was there any talk about when you offered the note at the end of your scene and you said, take the note, and was there any talk about filming an alternate where they actually did take the note? Ah, that's so interesting because, um, there's a part of me as both actor and uh, um, a character who so wanted them to take the note. And that was never an option. That was, I think that was, I mean, this is a director who had very, very strong thoughts about what this story was and how it would be told. And uh, there's such an interesting um, uh, difference in the two characters, in um, the young man and the young woman, that I think she would have taken the note, but um, in that relationship, that it, um, in the world of the story, she would have deferred to the young man and not done that. So, uh, no, we never, we never shot an alternate take. And that's interesting because oftentimes you will, but that never came up. Since, uh, <clears throat> since you prepared without full access to the script, going into the role, did you understand the significance of your 10 minutes on screen in moving the story forward? Well, um, one of the things that Lisa will talk about is note what page the uh, scene or scenes you're in is on. And so there is a good deal of, well, maybe 10, 12 minutes before um, I call in. And then there is, uh, uh, well, Bruce has his long monologue. So there's, there's nine to 10 minutes of um, atmosphere creation, character creation, relationship creation. Then Bruce has his phone call, and then I have my phone call, and then there's what comes after that. So it was um, clear to me that this story would be something that propelled the action of other characters, but I did not know what it was. <laughs> so I knew it was important. It was also huge. I mean, when you see all those words on pages, you go, whoa. Because we see less and less dialogue in film and more and more action. You know? So to have that many lines, and this is, I mean, this is, something that I think this particular director is drawn to. He's drawn to the power of language and listening and the importance of listening. I'm curious to see his next film. This was his first film. I mean, he's done um, um, broadcast work for years, uh, but shooting mainly sports events. And I don't know about short films, so I'm curious to see what comes next from him? Thank you very much because I definitely enjoyed your characterization. Uh, it was definitely something that the whole film I enjoy. So if you, any of the participants that have not seen the film, I would urge you to see it. Uh, Amazon Prime and it is included in your membership. <laughs> ah, good for you. <laughs> yes. Uh, you'd asked me about that um, before we started to record. You'd asked me, Dan, about that those that long tracking shot. It's a very low tracking shot that goes through the town and then into the. Uh, just so you know, they used go karts to shoot that. Uh, apparently, there were three go karts that were used, uh, and I had a friend of mine 
uh, in the UK asked me, why did they do that low uh, tracking shot that was so weird? And I, I mean, I never felt that it was weird. That's a moment in the film when I have a really visceral response to what's going on. And it's almost um, um, uh, nauseating to go, oh my God, what's going on? And when he said, why is that? And I said, well, it's, it's the aliens. That's how they're watching people. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I just thought it was interesting that he had that question about that shot. I thought that was an amazing amount of uh, editing yeah. because it never looked as if it was edited. It looked like it was a single shot. I so, agree. And I think most people who watch it will will have a sense that it's that it's a really good effort by a filmmaker to put something like that in the film. It wasn't uh, probably wasn't. Uh, completely necessary. You could have pieced it together, but the way they did it, it was just really phenomenal. And I've heard people say that about several of the scenes. Oh my God, I couldn't understand the first nine minutes of Die. It was so quiet, I couldn't understand. And the scene could, the film could have started with, you know, Faye at the switchboard. And I, no, I think it would have been a very different film if those things weren't there. So what I'm, you know, I give myself the opportunity to do is to take in what the film is and go, whoa, this is, what is this story? Now, why this story? Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. For, I'm just very thankful for this, sharing this experience. I didn't watch yet because I have to upload this Amazon. I never, we don't have like in Russia, but it's really amazing. And I read a little bit about the film. So I'm looking forward to watch and thank you very much for the lecture. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much. I found this very inspiring and to hear uh, what you're saying about your work uh, coming from a, a place of real wisdom and uh, a kind of a quiet stoicism about what the whole process is. It was, it was really wonderful and very rewarding. Thank, thank you. So you. Much. Thank you, Stephen. Good to see you again. Good to see you again, too. Gail and I had the honor of uh, having Stephen here in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth, Texas area and doing a wonderful workshop with his uh, his own working process. So, um, Stephen, I invite you to post in your in the chat uh, any um, contact information or resource or or website or something like that that people can go to if they'd like to find out a little bit more about your work. Um, so, go for that. And um, uh, Gail has her own website, which is gailcronauer.com. Am I correct, Gail? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And certainly hope you look her up on imdb.com. You know, when you look up people on imdb.com, their star meter goes up. And so um, visiting her site, so you can see many of the other films and TV shows that she's worked on. You may have seen her many times without realizing it because she is a very transformational actor. Uh, and, and was so even before, you know, we got we got her check off eyes. Thank you, Gail, so much for sharing this, uh, this insight, your insight. This was uh, lovely. It's, I mean, I, I was curious as to um, what this would feel like for me. And um, in many ways, it's very similar to what I experienced in the audition. <laughs> that you come into it with some tools that you've rehearsed and practiced and uh, give over to um, real listening and uh, engagement with the person or persons to whom you're speaking or the camera <laughs> who becomes human for you. Thank you. This was great. Thank you, everyone. We will wrap up this episode of uh, Michael Chekhov, The NMCA Way. We've been here with Gail Cronauer discussing her role in The Vast of Night. And uh, please feel free to become a member of Facebook group, the International Michael Chekhov Association. And there are posted many, many resources for Michael Chekhov's work. And we are having live training coming up and we have many, many videos uh, on Lisa Dalton's YouTube channel. 
and also on checkoff.net, C-H-E-K-H-O-V.net. And you can also see there more about Gail Cronauer and under the faculty uh, list as she is one of our NMCA certified teachers. So she's also available for coaching and teaches locally in addition to her current, you know, retiring from her, her current uh, institutional job. So we hope to have more of Gail teaching and bringing us uh, her wisdom and experience. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. I can tell you what's going on. They've come here before. They like this place. They always have.